God's word is his will. It's his testament. So this is the confidence that we have if we ask anything according to his will. So when you find out what his will is, and it says that we know we have the request that we've asked. So if you ask according to his word, let's just make it, break it down. If we ask according to his word, we find out what his word says, and we ask in line with his word, what's going to happen? Then we know, everybody say, we know, we have the request that we've asked. Well, how would you act if you knew you had the request that you asked? I said, how would you act? When, you know, when you come out of that little, you don't even have to pray long. You say, Lord, you know, how do you act if you believe God heard you? See, a lot of people don't know if God heard them. You know, if they, well, I didn't really feel any goosebumps today. You know, I just didn't feel God. Well, you're not going to feel God in terms of feelings because God's a spirit. You're a spirit. You have emotions. You have feelings. But, but you walk by faith. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not an emotion. It is a substance on the inside. It's a knowing just like you know your name. Praise the Lord. So faith is one of those things that Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without it, you can't please God. He expects us to walk by faith. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. There's times I have spent hours just quoting that during the day. I walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because I'm being bombarded at the moment with a circumstance that's overwhelming. I don't like how in the world, what, you know, how can it happen? How can we change it? How can we fix it? How can we do it? And I just stay with, I walk by faith, not by sight. Meaning what? What the conditions say, what, what the reality is. I mean, there were times in life when, you know, we started a church with four kids, through, uh, you know, 30 years ago, and we needed more house than our budget could afford. Not, I walk by faith, not by sight. I walk by faith, not by sight. God is bigger than my budget. Come on, somebody say, God's bigger than my budget. He's been, his, his, his resources are bigger than the budget of this church. Praise the Lord. Bigger than whatever you could deal with. Or You just got to put your mouth on it and say, this is what the word says. I have more than enough. By his stripes, I'm healed. Praise the Lord. Well, I feel an unction on me because I'm excited about, we, we've, been, uh, we've been covering, you know, if you've been here with us on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, I have preached about 35 messages on the subject that we're talking about right now after last Wednesday. So I've been giving some supplemental stuff on Wednesdays because the Lord gave me this phrase coming into the new year, welcome to the future. Man, I just like, woo. I, man, I, sometimes I just get a phrase, I get a word like that, and I just grab hold of it. And I said, that's my word. I believe that's for, uh, for us as a church. And because uh, I, I pray and I seek God about it. And so um, as we launched into the new year, around February, uh, we started teaching along these lines. We're, we're calling this series, Welcome to the Future. Hallelujah. So uh, if you were kind of starting with us back, so we've preached, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. So if you haven't been with us, don't worry about it because we've had sections along the way. And so we're going to start a new section uh, in this. I'm really just... I'm doing this not only for you, but for me, and I'm giving you everything I know and more, and as I'm learning more along the way, everything I know about vision and faith, because faith is vision. If you have faith, it's a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen, but you're still walking according to what God's Word said, and God gives us His Word so He can put His vision on the inside of us. So let me back up just a minute. I gave you an outline of everything that we were going to be covering and I didn't know how long it was going to take us, so this might be the eternal series. Jesus may come before we finish this. I don't know. But, but actually, we're on, I, I see light at the end of the tunnel, meaning uh, I, I, this may take us another six, seven, eight weeks to, to finish this part. But, but I said everything up to what we've covered up till now to get to this part. Now we're about to buckle up and take off. Man, because I'm excited. Uh, really, I'll be honest, this is really uh, faith and vision has been one of those subjects that's kind of like just in you. You, you know, um, it's something you just, uh, I've been intrigued about it, along with other things like end time, certain things. But there's, this has been a lifelong, ever since I got into the ministry, I build my library around this subject. So I read stuff about vision and faith and leadership vision, and there's so many things. So, so we've covered a lot of territory. But I gave you an outline that I put together years ago. And, uh, and number one, we just said, what is vision? So we have really spent a lot of time just really trying to indoctrinate you. Doctrine means teaching what actually vision is. So it's a lot of different things. It's the call of God. It's the will of God for our life. It's the purpose of God. It's the dreams that we have. It's the goals that we have. And so we've covered some of those things on Wednesday nights and, and extended some of those things. And we've really broken it down and talked about faith and vision. You can't separate faith from vision. 
The first thing God, remember, did with Abraham was give him a vision. Why? Because he's going to be called the father of faith, right? So he put, gave him a vision. You're going to have a son, but, I, but I'm old. See, there's, the, there's that perception. There's that, when we talked about four weeks on perception, five weeks on perception, and uh, how important. There's a lot of what we could keep covering some of these things. The second thing, and this is where we're going to get into, let me give you actually where we're going. So where it comes from and why you need it. So we're going to, now we're, we're on number two today after 19 weeks or whatever. So, but, but the, this, rest part, this, this rest of it's not going to take quite as long, but, but really we're going to talk about why you need vision. I mean, we already know without it we perish, right? But then we're going to talk about how do you get it. So don't worry, if you stick around, you'll find out, how, how do I get it? And then really some of these things you already kind of pick up along the way. But then what vision will produce in your life? What, what does vision do for us when I get vision? And then finally, what do I do to bring the vision to pass? My dream, what do I do? Man, that's going to be fun. And uh, So let me also give you this. There's three purposes really for having vision. So you kind of break it down. So that's kind of where we're going, what we're talking about, but three different purposes for having vision. Number one, we said a vision, there's a vision which every person can have and should have, which includes all of the promises of God. Now, that's really what we spend in the majority of our time teaching you about, because those are the promises of God. And all the promises of God are what? Anybody know? Yes, yes and amen. So that means they're there, but you have to have the faith to say, okay, I'll take it. It's mine. It's kind of like this. I thought about this this week. It's like you can stand outside the window of a bakery, right? And they're making all the bread. And you could actually own the bakery and stand out there the whole time. Well, you have to access the door. You have to get in there. And faith is your access into grace. Romans 5, 1 says, by faith, we access all the grace that God has for us. So you can stand out there. You can even smell it. You go, hmm, man, that bread, look at them cinnamon rolls. That bread all looks good, smells good. Mm, some of y'all getting hungry already, right? Anyway, and you can just sniff that bread. Woo, it smells good. And just stand out there and never access what already belongs to you. So it's important. So a vision which every person can have, should have, which includes all the promises of God. Healing is a promise. Provision is a promise. Amen. Joy and peace. Those are all things that are promised us of God if we do what it takes and what, what requ what's required to do that. The second thing for having re, uh, a purpose is a vision that God gives us, which includes the plan of God, the will of God for our life. And we spent some time covering that. So God, listen, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about this next week because every single one of us are different. We're individually made, created, but God has a plan for every one of us. I said God has a plan for every one of us. And it doesn't matter how where you came in along, you can still fulfill. Paul called it finishing your course. We have a race to run. Your race is not my race. Now, our, our races may, enter, may cross because we're working things together, doing things together with God, but we all have a race to run. And we, 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 we complete it by keeping our eyes on Jesus, all right? So there's a vision that God gives, his plan, his will for our lives, our ministry. Uh, it's a view of your purpose in life. That's, God's got a plan for you, and it's good, amen, and expect it in. And then thirdly, there's a vision, a corporate vision for a church, uh, ministry, or a business. So if you've got a business, good businesses have long-term visions, long-term plans, right? And so there's things for a church. That's where a church comes in. We got, without a vision, we're not going to go anywhere. So that's why we have pictures on the wall and different things like that, and so Let's go back to this first, this second uh, thing on our outline about why do we need vision? Well, again, number one, Proverbs 29, 18 says where there's, where there's no vision, what happens? People perish. People perish. So number one, you need vision because without it, you're, got, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stagnate. You're going to perish. And God doesn't, uh, other translations say they run naked. The people run wild. So when it comes to a corporate vision, a business, you know, everybody, everybody is motivated by the vision, not by necessarily the do's and the don'ts. It's the vision. That motivates. It's so important. So here's the second thing. Without vision, we're not going to change our world. So the important thing is why do we need vision? Because we're called to change our world. Now, when I, say, when I say change our world, sometimes we automatically think, oh, the map up here. Oh, we're going to change the world. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But God's interested in changing you before you change the world. Get that? God's more interested in your spiritual growth before you go out and try to win Bob down the street. Because if you can get a smile on your face, he can get some joy in your heart. If he can get you, uh, you know, with plenty, you can go down and mow Bob's yard. You can help Bob. When somebody, Bob's having trouble, you're there for Bob. And now you're a witness to Bob. Come on, that's what being a Christian is. 
Praise the Lord for Bob, right? All right. So we're to change our world. But it starts with us. Our, we, we have a world. You, when you walk in your house, that's your world. Sometimes I watch, I like Waters World. Y'all seen Waters World? I'm Waters, and this is my world. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Y'all see Fox News? Okay, y'all yeah, don't know what I'm talking about. All right, just don't, don't worry about it. I, just, but I like that. He, said, he says, I'm Waters, and this is my world. Anyway, he does interviews with people out on the beach, different things. I'm Waters, and this is my world. Anyway, and they're like, what? <laughs> anyway, so, but you have a world where you go to work. That's your world. Where you play, you go to the gym, whatever you do, that's your world. Where people that you come into contact with, that's your world. And Jesus said, go into all your, all the world. The world is where you go, where you play, where you work. That's, that's your world. That's, that's, where you, that's where you do life with your family. That's your world. I mean, with me so far. So we've got to change our world. Man, Lord, help me, Jesus. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, because I need to implement this and move along and hopefully... Uh, You know, I'm I'm just going to slow down, take a breath, because, man, I get fired up on this stuff. Man, glory. I've seen God work. I've seen God change people's lives. You can go from, man, here to here and quickly, quickly. Genesis 1, 26, then, so we're we're talking about what change in our world. Why do we need vision? To change our world. Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man, let us. There's there's your... There's your trinity right there. God said, let us. More than one. God said, let us make man in our own image. According to our own likeness, let them, now notice, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and, every, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Well, we know we got authority over the devil then, because he's a creep. A lot of creeps out there, you got authority over the creeps. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. Come on, say that. I've been in create, say, I've been created in the image of God. That's awesome. Just think on that a minute. I'm created in the image of God. And then, of course, as we're beholding, we've been talking about, and then we're transformed into that image. I'm created in the image, but now I'm putting on that image, talking like God, living like God, acting like, you know, somebody, oh, who you think you are, God? Well, I'm, I'm the body of Christ. I'm, I'm a Christian. That means Christ one, anointed, living supernatural. All right, let's keep going. Verse 28, then God blessed them, say God blessed them, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Now watch this, subdue it, the earth, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. So to subdue, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now here's the bottom line. God has given dominion, God's given us, given man dominion over the earth and he expects us to change it. Think about this. When God created the garden, he actually, Eden, the garden of Eden was a particular, a particular place, and it was thoroughly furnished. It was opulent. It was perfect. And God showed, basically showed Adam, I've given you every seed bearing, I mean, I've given you everything you need to reproduce this. Take dominion, work it, reproduce it, multiply it, because here's the bottom line. The earth is actually better when man gets his hands on it. That's why we're created in the image of God. We can do some things. So he said, he said, subdue it, rule over it. God expected Adam to do something. Why? Because he created in his image. And so the Hebrew word subdue means to conquer. It means to tread down. It means to bring into subjection. So here's the bottom line. God expects change. He really does. The earth doesn't produce like it should until man gets his hands on it. You ever seen a field? And the farmer gets out, and the field doesn't produce all by itself, but the farmer gets out, works the field. You get out, just just try leaving your yard unmowed and unedged and all that for about two months and see what happens. It actually works better. You take dominion over the yard. Why? Because you edged it. You mowed it. You cleaned it up. You trimmed the trees. You took dominion. You understand what dominion means? You're ruling over it. You're taking authority. Somebody comes into your yard that's not supposed to be in your yard, critters or whatever, you, then you, get, you call the terminator, right? You know? <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Genesis 2, 19 says, out of the ground. So let me say, man's hands are actually better for the earth than when it's left alone. Genesis 2, 19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. He brought them to Adam. Now watch this, to see what he would call them. God didn't name the animals. Did you know that? He said, let's see what Adam's going to call them. And, every, and, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So again, you just, it's simple to see. Not every, it's not complete 
until man does some things. How many got the picture here so far? So here's the deal. We've been given a commission to change things. God expects us to change, number one, our world, our environment, our city, our neighborhood. Our, you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're to be the change agents. And there are a lot of people who just think that Christianity is just a matter of accepting things that come their way. Or, or to be a good Christian, you know, you just got to learn to roll with the punches. You know, if it's something negative comes, you know, you just got to, you know, just, just take it cheerfully. No, that's not true. That's not right. We don't take the punches. Christians don't just roll, well, you know, whatever comes, I just got to deal with it. No, that's wrong thinking. God says, you move the mountain. When stuff gets in your way, it's not well, because we're in a fight. There's a battle. There's an enemy. Are you here? And so it's wrong thinking. I think about this. I mean, let me give you some examples. What would have happened if Abraham would have accepted the barrenness of Sarah's womb as the will of God? Well, he didn't. Because God said, you're going to have a child. Well, okay, Lord, we got a problem here. I mean, we're old, but God says, yeah, well, you don't focus on that. I'm going to change your name to Abraham, father of many nations. I'm going to get your mouth working. I'm going to change you on the inside so I can change your environment on the outside. I got to get you speaking right. I got to get you thinking right. Because I call those things as be not as though they were. Get you talking right. So that's part of everything that we've been. And see, as he's calling those things, he's got a vision on the inside. He sees something. He's, I think about, what if Moses would have accepted Pharaoh's no? Let my people go. What if Pharaoh said, well, he said several times. He said, no, I ain't doing it. Fine. You know, I'm coming. I'll, I'll see you here. I'll have another word for you coming up. We'll see what else God's going to do. <laughs> right? But he had a vision. I mean, think about it. God told Moses, you're my man. I want you to go in. You're going to go to Pharaoh. Moses is like, are you sure you got the right guy? And he's, and he's, having, to, he's having to convince Moses, that, yeah, you can do it. What if Joseph would have accepted life in the prison cell? Well, you know, God's sovereign must be his plan. Man, it's been hard. Life's been hard. I've been in the pit. My brothers threw me in the pit, you know, and sold me off. And now I'm in, the, what, now I'm in a jail cell. I mean, he could have really got a bad attitude, right? Could have been mad at God. A lot, a lot of people get mad at God. Why, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But he kept a good attitude, and he told the butler and the baker, hey, when you get out of here, get me out of here. You understand? Get me out of here. How did he know that that wasn't God's plan for his life? Because he already had a dream. God will always give you vision. You know what happens? So many people are so need-oriented instead of vision-oriented. And they're so focused on the need. And what happens is God will give you a vision so you can fulfill the need. Sometimes we, we just see the need. Or that's why you want to pray about, well, how do, I, how do I, God, what do you want me to do? He'll give you the vision to meet the need. But we're so need-oriented, we can't, we don't, it, it's blowing out the vision. We can't hear. We can't see what God's trying to tell us. And so God gives us pictures of the palace. God never gave uh, Joseph a picture of the pit. He showed him people bowing. Remember, he saw the sun and the moon bowing. He gave him a dream. He saw, I mean, basically, he told us to his parents, and they got up. That's why they got all mad. At him. Here comes the dreamer. And they got mad at him. Why doesn't God show us what he brings us through instead of where he wants us to go? You ever notice that? God doesn't, he was not going to show you, oh, well, now you're going to, now he did tell Paul, you know, you're going to suffer some things, but he also had a greater vision, and so he had endurance to go through those things. But God doesn't do that, because when Joseph was in the pit, he said, this is not where I, what I saw. He said, I'm getting out of here. Some of you need to realize that with situations in your life. You need, all you need to say is, you know what, I'm not staying here. If you're going through hell, don't stop. If you catch hell, don't hold it. Going through, going through, going through. That was an old Ron Canole song, going through, going through, going through. Anybody remember that song? Anyway. And a lot of people, sometimes they say, well, I'm trusting God. I love him, you know. He, he's going to do in my life whatever he wants. No, no, that's not true. You can't just float through life. Some people just, you know, go with the flow. Visionaries create their own. And everybody is to be a visionary. Whatever we do, I mean, we give God the glory, but we're, we're to be involved with what happens. God wants it. God's sovereignty is not threatened by our involvement. There is a sovereignty side to God, but he is not threatened when we get involved, when we believe him and we work with him. In his sovereignty, he chooses to allow us to have a part in his work. He wants us to work with him. So God's plan, think about it. If you think about Abraham, God's plan for Abraham was conditional. 
If you look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God says, if Gabe, I, I know Abraham will do this so I can bring upon him all the things that I have said. He'll do what I told him to do. David was like that too. God chose a David who was a man after his own heart, who would do all that was in his heart. That's why God chose David. You got to be willing to do what God wants you to do. And involved with that is good things. So uh, God expects us to change our world. He expects us to make a difference. And so we have the responsibility to change things in our life that we don't like. Things, what do you mean things that we don't like? Things that don't line up with the word. But we won't do it without vision. Think, for example, the woman with the issue of blood. Mark chapter 5. She spent all the money that she had. Had grown, she had, you know, she's losing blood. She's weak. 12 years. Has spent all her money on doctors, physicians. Nobody could help her. And it said, after hearing about Jesus, she said, See, that was the deal. She heard about Jesus, the master, the healer. She said, now what if she just, accept, I, I guess this, I'm never going to get ill. I'm just going, what if I'm just supposed to accept this condition? She said, no, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And she pressed in. She, she did something. She actually, Jesus was just going to Jairus' house. And she pressed in and stopped the whole crowd. And Jesus said, whoa, wait a minute, somebody touch me. The disciples said, what do you mean, Lord? Everybody's touching you. The crowd is thronging you. And the new 20th century translation says, somebody made a demand on my ability. She went in and just took what was already there for her provision. Think about this. I, you know, I've, I've been in sports, you know, grew up doing sports and been around, you know, Ben has a gym. And so, you know, I've been in a lot of different gyms. When God says to change things, vision is what he uses. It's the pictures that he uses to work with. I've never walked in. Usually you go into gyms, you see signs like you can do it, stay with it, you can make it, you know, different stuff. I've never walked into a gym and saw a picture of Barney Fife, you know, Don Knotts on the wall in a, in a, you know, in a little wife beater, you know, one of them little shirts, you know, kind of standing over like that. And down underneath, you can be him. No. No, no, usually you go into a gym, they got somebody, pictures of like Arnold Schwarzenegger up there, you know, and they're like, yeah, three, two, three years, I can, I can be like Arnold, woo! Why? Because it's vision that motivates. And that's, it's a picture that God uses and somebody thinks, well, maybe that can happen to me. Yeah, it's not going to happen if you don't lift any weights. You can look at that picture all you want, right? But until you start pressing... Moving towards the vision, then things begin to change. See, that's the way God works in our life. You got to get a picture. You put a picture, put pictures on your refrigerator, that house, that car, that business, that dream. You got to put the dream in front of you. You understand what I'm saying? You, you know, and this is where I'm going. Hallelujah. So it's important. So if we're going to have any passion or purpose or momentum in life, you got to have vision. Where do you want to be five years from now? Where do you want to be one year from now, two years from now? Jesus tarries 10 years from now. Where do you want to be? All things are possible if you believe God. Remember the woman, the man that brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus right there in Mark chapter 9? He said, basically, he said, Lord, if you can do anything, have pity, have mercy, help us. And Jesus said, it's not according to what I can do. Now, that's huge. Listen. It's not a matter of what I, because a lot of people are just waiting on God. I wish God would just do something for me. He said, it's not a matter of what I can do. It's a way, if you can believe. All things are possible. Man said, Lord, help my unbelief. <laughs> help me. So, you don't have to stay in the condition that you're in. Nobody does. Physically, materially, spiritually, single, jobless, whatever. You don't have to stay there. You can change. Sometimes that change just starts right here on the inside. I'm getting the vision on the inside. Can you say amen? amen? You can change your world with the vision that's in your heart. Now go to Hebrews chapter 11. This is part two right here. We're going to finish this up real fast. So you got you to stay with me. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now watch this. Faith without, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Everybody say evidence. Evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance now, this is actually not even where this starts. If you back up in chapter 10, he's actually leading up. He's saying a few things just to lead up to this point. He says, faith is the substance. Now, let me just back up. Where does faith come? How does faith come? By hearing. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Sometimes we're saying, Lord, I just need more faith. No, Jesus said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you'd say to the mountain, be moved. Sometimes it's just, it's just taking that little mustard seed faith 
and speaking. You would say. He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say. If you have faith, let me say that again. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say. Many of us have enough mustard seed already on that. You just got to get busy saying. Why? Because you say what you see. And you got to see, and what you see is what you're getting in your heart. We've been talking about that on Wednesday night. Anyway, now watch this. Amplified Bible says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation of the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. That means it's not something, well, I don't have a, it's not a feeling. I got a knowing down here on the inside. Message translation says, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. I like this. It's our handle on what we can't see. He's talking about your natural eyes. It's our handle. You can get a handle on what you can't see, but yet I do see it because I got a different sight. I'm walking by faith, not by sight. It's a spiritual sight. Are you with me now? Now watch this. Now watch this. Let's keep going here. So we need to realize, hopefully you're getting the picture here by now, that God establishes his plan in the earth. The way he does it is he uses mental pictures. How's God going to get his plan in the earth? He, is, he, he, he releases mental pictures. He gives words. words that's why the word of pro, a word of prophecy is an encouraging word. It helps. It lifts. So he puts a vision in the hearts and minds of his people to show them what he wants them to do so they can change the world. Why do you think Acts 2.17 says, God, when he pours out his spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams? There's really two things. You either see in visions or dream in dreams. If you're walking with God and you're pursuing God and you're hungry for God, you're seeing visions, visions for your business, visions for how to help change things, changing your life, change, you understand? Vision. And notice it's interesting that he gives the young men vision. I'm still young because I got vision. I must be young, praise the Lord. Renews my youth like the eagle, praise the Lord. Amen. But a visionary is a change agent. Now, keep going. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Now, now if, you, if I, I don't have verse 2 up there, but verse 2 says, By faith the men of old gained approval. Everybody say they gained approval. Now, verse 3. Now, watch this. You're fixing to learn something brand new. Maybe you've never seen this before. Watch this. Verse 3 says, By faith we understand. Now, you're going to understand something here. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now, watch this. The worlds were framed. Everybody say, the worlds, plural, not just one world. The worlds were framed by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of that which did appear. So, what's he saying right here? Well, let me just break these words down for you. There's two words, worlds and frame. The word worlds is the Greek word annuals. It refers to, listen, specific allotted periods of time within the past history of mankind, decades, generations, centuries, millenniums. So what's he saying is by faith we understand that the decades, the generations, the centuries, the millenniums were framed by the Word of God. Now, listen, he's not talking about creation here. Now, we know God spoke and created, but he's not talking about creation here because he's talking about men of faith, He's, he, he's, he's, he's not changing the subject here. So he's not talking about creation. He's talking about transformation. He's talking about recreation. Taking something that's there and changing it. Are you with me here? That's what faith does. It takes the picture. So the word framed is the Greek word kartaterizo. It means to take an already existing thing. It's already there. An already existing thing. And to change or alter its outward form or shape. So not creation, but recreation, a transformation. So here's the bottom line. Vision is a clear mental image of a preferable future imparted by God to his servants. Hallelujah. So think about it. It's it's a picture. This This is simply talking about how God took people from all the past century, all people like Abraham, Noah, David, and he gives them a word. And they take that word and they run with that word. They run with that vision. Are you with me here just a minute? So it's a picture held in your mind's eye of the way things could or should be in the days of it. It's a portrait of conditions that do not currently exist. For example, when God told Moses, the children are bound. I'm I'm sending you to go to Pharaoh. It's time for the people to go free. Well, right now, they're presently in bondage. So how many know something's fixing to change? So Moses is acting on the word of God. You got the picture here? So it's all by the word of God. You get the word, 
you get vision. This whole chapter, chapter 11, is about people who received the word, they obeyed it, and they changed the world in which they lived. Are you with me? Here's something, verse 3, notice again verse 3, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the what? The word. See, you know, the good part about study aids is you can find out when you look up different words, the word word there is the word rhema. What's rhema mean? Rhema means the spoken word. So sometimes in situations in life, we already have the written word, but while you're reading, you're studying, you're searching God, Lord, thank you for my word, for my situation, and that word that, that in, enlightens, it's like that rhema. But, it's a, but sometimes there's words that aren't in the Bible. Like I had God tell me, I want you to start, I, want you, I heard real clear, go to Lubbock, start a church. I heard real clear, I want you to go to Post, start a church. I've had certain words that are real clear. Those are rhema words, and you can go a long ways on those rhema words. Hallelujah. When he rebuked me one time, I was telling you about my candy store with the kids. He said, that's the way you do me. That's like I heard it yesterday. That's a rhema word. So this, this, what he's talking about, by faith, we understand that the world, the different decades and time periods and seasons and millennium were framed, they were, they were framed up, changed by the word of God because these people took God's word, what he spoke to them, and they went and just did. And they followed through with that word. You see what I'm saying here? So vision asserts control over its environment. By the, by the empowerment of God's word and direction and changes the environment or the present circumstances. Remember when Noah, when God told Noah, build a boat. That's not a long word. Just sometimes we're looking for this, you know, as a pastor, sometimes I've had people bring me a three-page, four-page, five, ten-page. This is a prophecy that so-and-so gave me. Would you read it and tell me what you think? I'm like, well, I see one word. Obey God. <laughs> you know, um, but it's just that one word, build a boat. And gather the animal. He gave him some instruction. So think about it. Old Noah took that word, obeyed God, and it wasn't a matter of time. In a hundred years, that's a long time to run with that vision, though. But the time came. How I many you know everything was totally changed? But it wasn't just because it was God's plan. Somebody had to work with God. And that's the way God operates. Nehemiah, he stood on a word from God on the basis of vision. He said, God put a word in my heart. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 12. What he, God put in my heart to go rebuild these walls. God puts a, a picture, he puts a word, a desire on the inside of you for, to do something. I want you to work in children's ministry. I want you to go on a mission trip. You just, you, I mean, I'm not saying you heard that voice, but just down on the inside, you had a knowing. This is, I believe this is what God wants me to do. You don't have to be super spiritual about it. Sometimes you say, well, the Lord told me. Well, really, you didn't hear anything. You just knew down on the inside because you got the mind of Christ. Sometimes it sounds real spiritual, but it's really not that hard. It's just God in you, leading you, and guiding you. Moses carrying out the God, God Joshua and Caleb. What if they said, well, yeah, you guys are right. I guess we can't do it. No, 10 spies said we can't. Joshua and Caleb says, you guys need to shut up. We are well able to go up and possess the land. What if they, what if they bought into that? What if, but no, they didn't. They had a different perception. So think about how things changed. They believed it. They took, or took a little while, 40 years of leading the youth group. And then they led them into the promised land. And they went and they possessed the land. Totally changed. They, see, things are, con how many know things are constantly changing? Because why? People are doing the word. We're to go and what? Reach the world. Why? We're, it's basically change the world. Make disciples. Change homes. Change lives. Change marriages. Change individuals. Are you here? The reshaping of their generation was so complete that verse 3 says, so that the things which are seen were not made out of things which do appear. That means by the time that they accomplished what God gave them to do, the generation was so thoroughly changed, it didn't compare with where it started. I think about Kenneth Hagin Ministries, where I went to school years ago when they started Rama. Now there's over, I don't know how many, there's two, over 250 Rama schools throughout the world. I don't know how many graduates now, all over the planet. Amazing. People like Billy Graham. Think about the impact on people that just obeyed God. Think about the person that saved Billy Graham. They get all in the rewards. People that saved People that took a Bible. You know, Dr. Cho had the largest church in the world. He passed away now. Largest church in the world in South Korea. A person took him a Bible, got him saved. What about that person? Think about the, the rewards. 
So sometimes it's not just behind the pulpit and preaching, but it's you just reaching somebody, and then everything, that seed that you sowed, everything, all the lives that begin to do things, you're just right in there, and that's your seed that you multiply. Helping people, loving people, serving people. Think about Harvest Church, 30 years. Come on. We've, cha- we've, we've, we've helped change five cities right here in West Texas. Post, Seminole. Seminole's different. Seminole's changed. Plainview. Uh, La Mesa. I mean, not only that, but nations. I mean, since I started 30 years ago, I've been to 27 different countries preaching the word, preaching to ministers, Bible school students, churches, books going out, changing life. So what happens is things begin to change. People's lives begin. That's the greatest change. People's lives are being changed, turned around, profiting from the word of God because we're supposed to profit. The word profits us. Hallelujah. We could just go on and on. Standing on one word from the Lord can change a generation. That's what David, David said. He fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. He did everything God wanted him to do. God uses his word to do what? Get his vision on the inside of us. Did I, did, did I make it real clear this morning? So, and I'm just thought you take it down to the basic principle of he sent his word and healed us. And delivered us from all destruction. You can grab hold of that one word and you can meditate on it and you can change your physical body. If it's hurting, you got cancer, you got disease fighting you, you got high blood pressure, low blood pressure, whatever heart disease, whatever arthritis. I, I say, Arthur can't stay. Hallelujah. We're going to fix Arthur. Mm-mm. You understand? You can do whatever you believe. <laughs> And, you, and God's going to help you. Praise the Lord. God gets his, get, uses his word to get his vision. And the purpose of vision is to create the future. How many like to just create your future? Think about it. Why do people go to school? Well, they got a little bit of an idea of the future. They want to be a doctor. They want to be an uh, engineer, whatever. So they've already got something in mind that they're heading towards, right? So they start what? Preparing. you going, you know. I mean, wasn't that long ago, Sherry just decided, you know, I'm going to go to realtor school. Now, she's one of the top realtors in Lubbock. Now, I ain't been, what, two years? I mean, three years just kicking everybody's tail. Come on. I said, you can do it. But she had a vision to do those things. Different ones in here. I mean, I start looking around different people. Ramon, man, that business is exploding. I mean, I mean, different people doing different jobs and things. But you know what? It didn't happen automatically. God just said, well, you know, I'm just going to sit back here and just let God do it. No, you got to put your hand to it and believe God. Amen. Doing school, whatever. Vision defines the parameters within which the future will emerge. It's your parameters. Where am I going? What am I doing? The future is not something that just happens. It's a reality that's created by those strong enough to exert control over their environment. God said, told Adam, I've given you dominion. Subdue it. Take authority. And we have authority. So really don't have any excuses, right? So the future belongs to God and through him and his word to those who are driven to shape it. That's why people of God are called to what? Change the world. Reach the world. Make a difference. Our world is framed, listen, by the words we speak because of the vision in our heart. So you got to go back to what's in my heart. I put that word, I put God's word in my heart, and basically you can say you'll have tomorrow what you speak today. And what you're speaking today is because of what you put in your heart. Can you say amen? Did you learn something this morning? So what are we? We're change agents. We're visionaries. Hallelujah. We want to change what? Number one, start with you. Change your heart where you need to change it. Change your body. Change your home. How many of you can change your marriage? You can change, you can change whatever needs to be. There's always change, right? Always something that needs to be. The dishes need to be changed. Right? Underwear needs to be changed. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes it's just new underwear. Don't wait till Christmas. <laughs> new socks, new underwear. Sometimes you need it before Christmas shows up. I'm telling you now. Oh, I'm having fun. Stand up. Let's just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. How do you see yourself? God says, change your world. I've, you know, I, I mean, it's, I'm not saying anything about me. It's not me. I, don't, I, I have changed my world by just following the plan of God. You see what I'm saying? Not, not me. I'm working with God. I'm just doing what he told me to do. I mean, 
you, I could show you pictures of just this area right here, Southwest Lubbock, our, our buildings like 30 years ago. You'd say, but what's on the inside is totally different than what it was 30 years ago. The parking lot, the buildings, I mean, every, the whole neighborhood, everything. And things grow, things change. Why? Because men are working it. Men are, have a plan. I mean, our city has what's called a planning committee. Why do they have a planning committee? Because if we don't have a planning committee, it's going to get overrun, and you end up with little two-way streets, and nobody can get through there. Right? You see what I'm saying? So you got to have a planning committee, you and your wife are the comp- planning committee. you got a planning committee over your finances. Get a planning committee on the house. Get a comp- planning committee on who's doing what around here and who's going where and what do we need to do and what adjustments do we need to make right now. And Hallelujah. I'm done. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, I just want you to lift up your eyes and see a little bit bigger. Lift up your heart. Let God enlarge your heart. Hallelujah. As a church, come on. Grab a hold of the vision. The Bible says, run. Write it down so those who read it can run. That's what we do with the vision. Lord, help us to be runners with the vision of God, what you put in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for showing us more than we've ever seen. Hallelujah. You're doing more in us, through us, and for us than we've ever seen before. We're experiencing it, walking in it. Thank you, Lord. Our best days are right now and ahead. So, Lord, we're preparing, we're planning, we're praying. Hallelujah. We're pursuing. Hallelujah. And we're not quitting. Right now, those of you, you've been thinking about quitting, you've been thinking about just giving up. No, no, don't do it. That just came right from the Spirit right there. Don't do it. Start speaking to the, into that situation. Take dominion. Do what the words take dominion. He said, how in the world do I take dominion? With your words, you have authority. Jesus took dominion in the midst of a storm. And what did he say? Peace, be still. He took dominion in that situation and changed it. Changed it. Changed it. That's really how you change things. With the word, speak over your business. Speak into your finances. Hallelujah. Call those things which be not as though they were. Look at the steps of Abraham, Romans 4, as he began to walk with God. And to the point, he called himself what God said he was, a father of many nations. Come on, let God begin to put his vision on the inside of you. Seeing yourself blessed, seeing yourself healed. Seeing yourself, hallelujah, happy, and you're excited about the future. Come on, anybody excited about your future? Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on, you'd say, if you really saw it, you'd say, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on, let's give him some glory right now. Come on, just give him some glory. Thank you for my future, Lord. My future's good. Hallelujah. I'm not a, I, I mean, come on, you're more than a conqueror. Glory. You've been set free. Think about this. Remember Psalm 107, verse 2, and then I'm going to let you go. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Well, I know I'm redeemed, you know, I'm waiting on God. No, he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That means you're exercising your authority. Hey, devil, take your stinking hands off of my body, off my stuff. You go now in the name of Jesus. Everybody say this one more time. The devil's bound and shut down. I'm blessed. I'm increasing. Hallelujah. My church is blessed. (laughs) I'm blessed. I'm free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, say, I have vision. Start talking about it. I have vision. Say it again. I have vision. Hallelujah. I have vision. I say like this. I've told you, you've heard it before. I, I, I agree with Paul. I call myself, I'm a wise master builder. That's what Paul said. I'm a wise master builder. We're building things around here. Praise God. <laughs> you say, why are you waiting? Because some of you are just still getting some things here. Sometimes the, the Holy Spirit, there's two people that talk a whole lot at the end of a service, the devil and the Holy Spirit. And you got to make sure you're hearing the Holy Spirit. <laughs> why? Because the devil comes to steal the seed of the word. So he's working, and then you got the Holy Spirit working. Praise the Lord. And I'm just, I just feel like the vision is just kind of settling in. Something's kind of like, okay, yeah, I see it, I see it, I see it. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands one more time. See if we're done. Lord, thank you. Mm, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So faithful, Lord. You're so faithful. Hallelujah.
Just wait on him a minute. Thank you, Lord. You can, you can drop something in the hearts of somebody right now, Lord. Thank you. Sometimes he does that. He just takes us a minute. We're just waiting on him. He can give you one word. One word can change your life. One word. Just one word. Seeing something. Picture an idea. Some, sometimes I get, I, get, I get ideas. I'll, just, I'll be in a service or something. Maybe go. And I'll just get an idea. I'll say, wow. And you run with that idea. Thank you for those ideas. Doors of opportunity. Vision. Hallelujah. Wisdom. Because wisdom is seeing. So, Lord, some of us need wisdom right now. Thank you for the wisdom. You remember James 5? I'm saying this for a reason because I'm just, I have none of this planned. I just, as we're going along, because I'm answering some, the Lord's just answering some people's questions. James 5 says, if you lack wisdom, wisdom is, has vision to it. If you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach, and it shall be given. So lift your hands right now. There's wisdom being imparted. Father, I thank you right now for your people. Thank you for wisdom. We ask you for the wisdom that we need right now in our circumstance that you're directing us. Thank you for the wisdom that we need in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, I'll let you go because we got some fun to do. Midweek cool. service, we and the uh, pastor is going to be bringing an awesome word. And we are also going to be having a potato bar with the fixings, is what I've been told. So that's going to be a great time. Join us tonight at Adeldew Farms for celebrating 30 years of ministry in the church. It's going to be a good time from 5 to 8. If you guys can show up a little bit early to help us set up, that would be much appreciated and such a blessing. But just uh, we will see you tonight. It's good to see you. Have a wonderful week, and you are dismissed.